and they're going to be talking to us about their latest work uh, in additive manufacturing. And our first speaker, I will bring them up onto the stage. Um, Great. So our first speaker for today is Dr. Jia Min Lee. Hello, Dr. Jia Min Lee. How are you? Hi. Great. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. So right. Dr. Jia Min Lee is a research fellow at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. And um, a fun fact about her, her current research interests lie in recreating biomimetic microenvironments to capture habitat of mammalian cells. I find that so fascinating and it's completely out of my depth and I'm very excited for your presentation, which is on controlling site specificity using inkjet bioprinting for biological applications. So I'll leave it to you if you'd like to share your screen. Yeah. Um... Can you see my presentation too? Yeah. All right. Hi. So a uh, very good um, afternoon. So it's actually right now afternoon in Singapore to all of you. And um, for, I am Jianlin. I'm a research fellow from uh, the school, the National Technological University. And I'm currently in the School of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. So the topic of my discussion today is to look into, uh, sorry, the title might differ a bit from the, the, the title that was being mentioned. So basically we are looking into the use of um, inject printing for uh, biological applications. So we'll discuss, so maybe before I begin my uh, presentation, I can take a brief introduction of myself. So um, I'm actually from Singapore and for those of you who might not be familiar, Singapore is somewhere right at the tiny dot that is just below Malaysia and somewhere that is north of Australia, north, northwest of Australia. So a bit about myself and the institute I'm in, NTU is actually a research intensive uh, public university. And currently, I'm in the School of Mechanical Engineering, as uh, previously mentioned. And for myself, I, I had my back, uh, background training in uh, bioengineering, which um, during my uh, research uh, um, with, uh, un, as an undergrad, I have actually the opportunity to work with uh, the, the public, uh, the National Water Agency to be involved in uh, microbial source tracking from sewage water. And then I further my uh, research in uh, the school, with the School of Mechanical Engineering, specifically in bioprinting, where I use uh, extrusion-based method to print uh, cells and uh, use that to create micro alignments of the tissues. So uh, after which um, I actually recently joined the uh, HP NTU Corp Lab, where I focuses on using inject printing to uh, create uh, the biomimetic microenvironment for cells to live in. So for, for those of you who are not familiar with bioprinting, um, I will have subsequent slides to further uh, elaborate more about it. Yeah. So that is the brief, uh, this is a brief overview of my current uh, agenda for today presentation. So I'll begin briefly by uh, uh, showing what bioprinting is about, and then uh, and then a focus on, focuses into the inject printing itself, and also ultimately what are the possible applications and potentials for inject bioprinting. So for uh, bioprinting, if we were to take a look at uh, bioprinting, we we have to understand what are the materials that we can use to print and then how, what happens during the process of the printing itself. And basically how bioprinting differs from conventional 3D printing is that the material that we use um, it, 
uh, we can actually uh, boil them down to more like biological uh, materials such as the biomaterials, the cells, and even the growth factors. And um, what happens during the printing process actually differs between different types of printing technology. It could be an extrusion, uh, inject, or even a uh, photopolymerization. Yeah. And then um, what can be printed? So virtually any shapes or forms or even heterogeneous materials. So, but uh, as we go down the research, we understand that uh, the, 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 the effect of a virtual, printing virtual, virtually any shapes is there's actually some form of limitation down there. So there are also different strategies that we can use to overcome this kind of um, structural limitation. So for bioprinting, um, I would categorize them into the three main categories. One would be a material jetting. So this, uh, this technologies will involve the, will in, the process itself will involve the formation of uh, droplets and then uh, subsequently the droplets will land on a substrate. And then um, the next category, the category will be the extrusion, material extrusion. So it can uses it uses uh mechanical or uh, pneumatic systems to do displacements of materials, and also um we have also uh, incorporate things like um melt extrusion. So something that's more familiar would be like the uh F -F, uh FDM process. So you use something like a PCL filament or a PLA filament, a thermoplastic filament that will actually be incorporated with uh, bioprinting to do what is also known as hybrid printing. Then there's also VET polymerization, whereby there's a, a reuses like uh, bio, biocompatible materials uh, that are photopolymerizable, such as PEG-DA or gel uh, mark. So these two materials are some of the common uh, biomaterials that are photopolymerizable and are used in uh, bioprinting. So the focus of my uh, today's presentation is actually more towards uh, material jetting. So for material jetting, to understand briefly, is about this. This actually the process is a two-stage process where we can understand at uh, these two different phases. One is during the jetting phase. One is the impact phase. So one uh, some of the advantages of using material jetting. Is such that it can have uh, there's a contactless deposition of materials onto the substrate, and you also get a good resolution because of the 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 uh, the amount of materials that we can uh, deposit per uh, per droplet unit is actually much smaller than let's say a uh, material extrusion. Um, so for the jetting process, uh, is actually. It's actually a very, uh, how to say, let's say it's a very long-standing technology that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And um, so we, the, main, the main objective, the main aim for, for the researchers here is to try to achieve a satellite-free droplets. And two main um, uh, numbers that we were trying to figure out is the Reynolds numbers and also the Weber's numbers. So if you were to take a look at some of the uh, relevant parameters for biomaterials, such as the viscosity or the surface tension, and, if, uh, and also the density of the biomaterials that are injectable, we can actually uh, derive that um, the jetting process is actually of a low Reynolds uh, number. And then uh, this, this, this is the range that we can do kind of some calculation and try to uh, talk the to uh, formulate materials that are more uh, injectable so another another aspect that we need to look into is the viscoelasticity of material so for biomaterials such as let's say collagen or gelatin they are they are actually the they are actually of non-Newtonian uh, behavior so there is this uh, elasticity component to the in itself, which we should consider during uh, formulation of materials. So on the other hand, so after the jetting process, when you look at how the droplets impact onto a substrate, we can also understand it based on two different uh, profile. One is whereby the droplet actually penetrates into the substrate, 
as compared to something like if you were to print onto, let's say, a glass light or a, pet, a petri dish. Uh, yes. So with this, um, these two scenarios are actually quite common in bioprinting. So it is either you print on, uh, print the uh, materials onto a uh, plasticware or glassware, or whereby you print it when the when the material actually gets printed on the previous layer, such as a gelatin or a biomaterial area, uh, substrate. So in H, uh, currently when I'm working in a HP NTU, so we are using uh, inject printers and also we're trying to formulate uh, materials such that we can reduce the satellite formation of the uh, drop, uh, uh, droplets upon impact to the substrate itself. So when we look into how the droplets actually uh, interacts with substrates that are non-penetrative, things like glasswares or uh, uh, glass slides or petri dishes. So there are a few uh, key uh, parameters that we will look into uh, that will actually determine whether the droplets will splash, they will stick or will rebound from the droplet itself. And when the droplet impacts the surface without rebounding or splashing, the droplet actually spreads on the surface until it reaches a maximum droplet radius and it, it will be it also receive to form a smaller droplet depending on the surface property of the substrate. So the substrates, uh, this is the substrate and droplet interaction that occurs when there is, uh, the, the substrate itself is non-penetrative. So on the other hand, when, when, there's, uh, when the droplets is able to penetrate through the uh, substrate, uh, so the inks are properties such as the, the, the ink to drop into uh, the droplet to substrate relations such as the Frodo's um, elastic uh, will actually determine whether this um, the droplet is penetrative or not. And based on some literatures, we see that uh, it is possible that to, uh, to have uh, a, a projectile velocity of around 15 meters per second is sufficient to create an impact onto a skin. So what what does this mean if we were to uh, uh, get out of from inject printing for biological application? So one is where we can use the we can use the strength of inject printing where we can leverage on the uh, the precision that we can get from the droplets that we print, and then to control the resolutions of print in terms of depositing cells or biological materials uh, on a specific sites. Next, we also can use the inject printing to, uh, to actually integrate into other forms of bioprinting as well to, have, uh, to develop printing strategies that are unique to material jetting. So we can see that for, um, let's say, uh, for this uh, printing strategies that are shown here, they are more um, material extrusion forward. So uh, what, were, what are some of the other strategies that we can use to use to leverage on inject printing to better enhance, let's say, the structural integrity of uh, bioengineered tissues. And also, there's also recently there's also recent um, research interest in creating heterogeneous properties uh, for materials design. So one such uh, 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 application is to tune the substrates with different wettability and using that will induce certain cells to, to uh, uh, behave differently. And then last but not least, we also have the ability of using inject printing to actually print uh, different, uh, let's say, biological factors or patterning of different cell types to understand the different cell to drug interaction or even to use it uh, to design uh, substrates that can actually isolate uh, different uh, single cells and um, so what is uh, what in the grand scheme of things is to actually understand the mechanobiology whereby the cells how the cells responds to different material stiffness and different materials uh, property so another far-fetched idea that we can do we can actually think of is to actually see whether there's a possibility to actually um, create uh, in situ bioprinting that utilizes um, 
the ejecting system so that we can do uh, let's say a a a, a lab lab to uh 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 lab to lab to hospital kind of settings where we can actually uh, let's say deposit uh cells that are of therapeutical uh that as a therapy to to uh help solve uh the medical uh issues. So um with that um I ended my presentation. Thank you, Jimin. That was so fascinating. Um, this is just completely out of my depth, <laughs> this bio bioprinting um, sphere. But um, I did find it very interesting. And I have, so I have a question hmm. with regards to the materials that you use. So yep. obviously you'd have... Um, uh, you have to make sure that the material properties are compatible mm. with the human, uh, mm. like in human um, features. Mm -hmm. And you also have to make sure that the materials are uh, compatible with your inkjet printer. So yes. what, um, what are some key properties that uh, mm. you would keep in mind um, or you would use to measure the the biocompatibility and the 3D printing compatibility? And how okay. easy is it to like make sure they align? Okay, uh, so the short answer would be, it's not very easy <laughs> to align <laughs> these two. <laughs> yeah, so you, uh, you are right about the fact that we have to balance between the biocompatibility and also the printability. So printability wise, it actually differs between different types of printing technology. So for instance, like the extrusion or even in inject, there are actually two, you can say that two extreme kind of material uh, properties to be, to be uh, gen generic in terms of uh, describing. So for inject, there's this, um, this number that we, 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 we actually look into is called the Z value. The Z value is actually something that is associated with the, is actually the honest, the old O number. So you can do a few of calculation based on, let's say, the viscosity, the surface tension of the material, the density, and you can actually do a, 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 a rough estimate regarding, let's say, you have a new material to formulate, and then you, based on the different uh, properties, you can see whether it is something that is suitable for uh, bioprinting. Yes. Okay, interesting. Um, so... Then something else that um, caught my eye was uh, with the current research that exists for uh, bioprinting, um, particularly with inkjet printing, okay. um, where do you see, um, how do you see it going in the future? Um, what is currently lacking in this field and how uh, do you think that um, it can be improved in the near future? Like what are the advancements that you hope or you expect to um, arise in this space? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a very uh, good question. Yeah. And then for bioprinting, I would say that, that I think there is not a single printing technology that will be um, universal for all uh, for all, let's say, tissue application. I think this is also true for just 3D printing in general. So for bioprinting, what I foresee is the use of the integrating different types of uh, printing processes, let's say extrusion, jetting, or even wet polymerization to have some sort of uh, integrating these different printing technologies to actually help uh, circumvent some form of like disadvantage or the short uh, the limitations of each of the printing technologies and enhance the advantages in each of the different aspects. So for instance, like for extrusion, we might have some lacking in terms of the resolution. That is where the inject printing can come in play to actually help uh, to boost the advantages in, in its aspect. But of course, on uh, the inject end, there are also limitations in terms of the, 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 the range of materials that are processable. So if we can actually um, uh, choose the, the advantage of each of the technologies and then incorporate together that would be very good to have in uh, to actually help enhance uh, the biomanufacturing space and also a tissue engineering field okay interesting yeah. 
So um, I'd like to encourage um, the attendees to uh, ask any questions, um, but I, I do have one more that, um, so in terms of applications for this kind of research, um, how do you see uh, the products from your research being applied uh, in the real world? Okay, so um, right now, uh, I'm actually working on um, biofabrication, biofabricating uh, in vitro tissue models. So as it would, I will foresee that in the near future, um, this kind of tissue models will be something that will help in terms of uh, alternative testing methods in replacement for, let's like, say, animal testing in, in uh, cosmetics. So we understand that there's, uh, uh, the, 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 the recent um, uh, interest in um, reducing or even eliminating the use of animal testing for cosmetic products or even drug testing. So that would be something that is in the near future where we use it as a form of uh, alternative methods in uh, cosmetic or drug testing. Then definitely for tissue engineering, the ultimate goal is to do for replacement of uh, damaged tissues or even replace, let's say, an, an organ. So that is something that is very far down the road. And definitely we'll uh, need more researchers to come into play to look into the different types of materials that can be formulated or even come up with new printing technologies that can help better manufacture this kind of engineered tissues. Interesting um, that you talked about organs, organ yes. uh, <laughs> printing. Yeah, That's just... That really that is, just... <laughs> yeah, very sci-fi. <laughs> very futuristic <laughs> indeed. Yeah. Um, I did come across uh, a while ago an article mm. that was on um, uh, a 3D printed heart that mm -hmm. they had actually 3D printed. I'm not sure what technology um, they used mm. to 3D print that, mm -hmm, but... Mm -hmm. um, Essentially, uh, researchers in Israel, I think, 3D printed yes. a heart and a rabbit heart. Have you heard of this? Do you, yes, yes, yes. Can you it, so, like, elaborate on that? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, it basically is a, a method that is being, uh, the main printing uh, technology that was being used there was uh, extrusion, extrusion printing. So they actually, so what I previously mentioned with, bioprinting, there is this main a limitation that we need to overcome, which is the structural integrity. So imagine that the main materials that we use, like for biomaterials, the biomaterials that we use uh, are actually like hydrogels, which are actually soft and fluid. So mm -hmm. if you were to think of it in terms of the viscosity, it's something like the jellos that you make at home, that kind of uh, uh, cons consistency. And to overcome this kind of fluidity in terms of materials, um, the researcher actually tries to uh, come up with uh, a printing techniques to print the materials into a vet that actually forms like a support. So imagine it's, it's a bit like um, childbirth, but in the water, <laughs> in a water bath. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think, I think uh, yeah, you can have that, that Im imagery into your mind that, yeah, so you're actually introducing a materials within um, a vet containing let's say, uh, another form of more biocompatible bio materials in to support the, the main building material. So this is why we can think of it as a support to build a uh, system whereby you have something that will actually uh, have this buoyancy effect that will actually help you hold your uh, built material better. Yes. So that yep. is, um, they, I, th I think there's also a term that's called fresh, fresh printing. I think that is... That is, uh, it's, a, it's an acronym that you can actually uh, search more to uh, search on Google to understand more about how the researchers actually look into ways to uh, improve, uh, let's say, the, the, the existing conditions for uh, bioprinting such that we have a better structural uh, uh, tissues. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Um, sorry to keep you. We, we have no one problem. more question. <laughs> okay. um, so someone has asked, have you been working on this project with a specific, uh, sorry, I'll repeat that. Have you been working on this project with a specific medical project in mind? A medical project. 
So um, to be honest, as of now, we do not look into any specific medical uh, application. Yeah, so it's more towards the, the, the short-term goal of having an alternative tissue model for drug testings. Yes. So eventually, I mean, if, if we can progress forward, it, it would be good if we can look into, let's say, uh, more medical uh, relevant solutions. Yes. Okay, cool. And do you have any industry partners that you're collaborating with at the moment or would, would mind collaborating with? Do you think um, there's any industries right now that, um, or any specific, yeah, um, in the industry sector, like hospitals, oh, would they be interested? Opportunities. I'm, I'm sure there might be some, um, we can look into different opportunities in the uh, collaboration opportunities out there, yeah. Yeah, yeah, cool. Mm. Very cool. We have one more question that's come up. Um, so someone has asked, uh, with inkjet printing, approximately how many droplets can you print at once? At once. So um, in terms of the system that we have of now, uh, we are able to target uh, the, basically we, we change it by in terms of the frequency at which the 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 heating is heating element actually hits the the thermal inject. So we can uh control from five hundred hertz to one thousand hertz. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um great. So I think um, we're running a little bit, how we're going with time, I'm trying to see. Uh, oh, there's one more question, sorry. Um, okay, this is a pretty broad question. Um, what materials do you print with? Ah, okay, um, we print, we, we try uh, commercially available uh, materials such as alginate, collagen, and uh, we also do our own formulation in terms of uh, gel ma. So gel ma is actually a gelat gelatin-based uh, material that we chemically modified to be structurally stable. And um, I, what I can uh, share is also that usually these ranges of uh, materials, the, the concentration that we use will be much on the, the lower end as compared to, let's say, material extrusion. So the, the, the ink that we use in injecting will definitely be of a lower viscosity than uh, extrusion, yes. Okay, all right. Um, oh, one more has popped up. Uh, have you struggled to find biocompatible curing agents or do you mainly use thermoresponsive materials? Um, both, so... <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. for, for the biocompatible curing agents, um, such uh, we use uh, commercially available like photo initiators for, the, let's say, if you are using uh, photosensitive uh, materials such as uh, gel mark. So think uh, initiators such as the IngraCure or even the LAP. So these are the two uh, reagents that we, uh, initiators that we use for photo curing. As, as compared to, let's say, a thermal cross-linking, uh, you'll be looking into things like the collagen or the gelatin. Yeah, we do use all these different materials to actually uh, strategically uh, design uh, different uh, substrate beds for cells. Yes. Yep. That's fantastic. Um. That was thoroughly fascinating. Um, thank you so much. And sorry, we got a little bit mixed up with the time. And <laughs> oh, it's um, okay. Yeah, so um, I guess I'm not sure if the next speaker is here. I could um, potentially bring them on board um, for a chat prior to their presentation. Um, but in the meantime, I will thank you so much for your time and, and your time in answering the questions. Uh, very fascinating. And I wish you uh, the best of luck okay. for uh, your future research. <laughs> thank you, Tim. Thank you. Thanks.